Hello everyone, this is the live video on the eight limbs of yoga. I'll probably just uh, stall for a few seconds here so that <laughs> people can actually join. But this is also, uh, will be a recording that will be posted so I can't stall for too long. So we just want to get a few people on here and we can uh, get going with it. So today we're talking about the eight limbs of yoga, so-called eight limbs. Uh, this is, as it turns out, a poor translation of Ashtanga Yoga. Now we have a, a couple points of confusion to clear up because, of course, Ashtanga Yoga uh, was and is used by uh, Sri Patabi Joyce and his successors and followers to refer to a style of asana, a kind of um, vinyasa style in a specific set sequence, also known as Mysore style. So that use of the term is simply a case of um, a modern teacher co-opting a term that had street cred, as it were, <laughs> you know, ashtanga, people who knew about yoga had already heard of that term as being something important or sacred or whatever. So Patabi Joyce co-opted that term. Uh, you know, nothing against him, but he did co-opt it inappropriately. Meaning to say, uh, ashta means eight, anga means components or ancillaries or aids or less commonly limbs. And, you know, Patabi Joyce didn't teach in a standard class anyway. He didn't teach all eight limbs. He taught two or three. So the term is, from a literal etymological point of view, inappropriate. So when we talk about um, Ashtanga Yoga from a historical point of view or a Patanjalian point of view, we are of course talking about the eight-part yoga as taught by Patanjali at the end of the second chapter and beginning of the third chapter of the Yoga Sutra. Now did Patanjali create this eight-part yoga? Almost definitely not. He probably inherited it from earlier teachers. We don't know who. The Yoga Sutra became so important and so central as a text for many centuries that its immediate sources were lost because they were no longer considered necessary because everything was covered so well in the Yoga Sutra. So he had probably inherited it, and the Ashtanga Yoga itself is, in format, modeled on the Ashtanga Marga of Buddhism. Okay, they're two quite different sets of, of practices, not entirely different, but quite different. Um, it's just that Ashtanga Yoga is following that model of an eight-part um, practice that leads to liberation. So the Buddha called his method what he taught. He called it the Ashtanga Marga. Of course, the Buddha didn't teach Buddhism, just as Jesus didn't teach Christianity. Um, and he called what he taught uh, the Ashtanga Marga. So then, some centuries later, we get the Ashtanga Yoga. Now, why is it wrong to translate it as the eight limbs of yoga? Well, for two reasons. One, that implies that yoga is comprised of the eight limbs, that it's a practice consisting of the eight limbs, and as we will see, that's not actually the case. Patanjali, by the word yoga, always meant the state of being that yoga, that the practices that later came to be called yoga also, leads to. So this is a case of semantic extension linguistically, meaning to say a word that refers to one part of something comes to refer to another part or to the whole. So yoga in Patanjali's usage, as well as in the Bhagavad Gita's usage, as well as in the usage of all these classical texts from around 2,000 years ago, yoga means a state of being, right? Not... Um, not a practice. What state of being? Well, he defines it quite clearly for us in uh, Sutra 1.2, okay? And that says, if we translate it correctly, 
Yoga is the state in which the mental emotional fluctuations have become still. This is explicitly what Patanjali means by it, and we see it in the commentary immediately under that sutra where he says uh, yoga means samadhi. I'm using yoga in the sense of samadhi, a state in which all the mental emotional fluctuations have become still. Later on in the text, he explains that he means a specific version of samadhi near bija samadhi. That means yoga. Yoga means that. And we'll come back to this point. So again, for Patanjali, if yoga means the state of being that the practices lead to, then Ashtanga yoga becomes, um, you know, eight limbs of yoga becomes the wrong translation of that because it's not a, a, a practice that has eight parts. It's eight things that lead to yoga. So the most uh, correct translation that I've been able to find, um, and I th I'm sure many scholars would agree, is eight aids to yoga. Um, now, what we see uh, being, the term we see being used by scholars who understand this point is ancillary, eight ancillaries of yoga, but uh, ancillary is not a very um, descriptive term in English today, but it's, it's used to mean a necessary uh, component. Okay, so uh, none of, uh, the word anga here is implying that none of these are dispensable, none of these are, um, can be, you know, they're, they're all important, <laughs> Um, aids to yoga, right? And he arranges them in a specific order, these, these eight. And the order is really important because he kind of sees it as a progression, not in the sense that you need to master one anga before you go on to the next, but that each anga provides the foundation for what follows, okay? We have to, in that analysis, we have to take yama and niyama as a unit, essentially, um, well, you could argue that the yamas provide the foundation for the practice of the niyamas, but that obscures the point that for Patanjali the yamas are more important than the niyamas. But anyway, yamas and niyamas form a foundation for successful asana, which forms a foundation for successful uh, pranayama, which forms a foundation for successful pratyahara, and so on. So each is foundational to what follows, so you, you are meant to focus on you know, have a have a phase of your practice towards the beginning where you're more focused on yama and niyama, and then more focused on asana, and then more focused. But you're always doing all of them, right? Potentially, it doesn't mean to say that you shouldn't um, meditate from the get-go. That you should only do yamas, niyamas, and asana, or something. And which is indeed how some people, including for at least a period, Patabi Joyce took it. You know that no, you do this first master that, then go on. But that's not really what we see in the text. Patanjali clearly <laughs> wants the reader to be meditating virtually from the get-go, but one might focus on limbs one and two more in the first year of practice, let's say, and gradually shift that center of gravity or that, or that um, emphasis um, along the limbs through several years of practice. Okay? So, he envisions the eight aids uh, uh, to yoga as it's just kind of like a snowball rolling downhill and gaining momentum. And that momentum is very much needed because um, it gets subtler and subtler and more and more challenging to, to attain what it is that he is um, talking about. Okay, so to understand what's going on here, we have to look at a sutra that precedes the actual eight limb section. And I'm going to just go ahead and paste that in the chat window, and hopefully everyone will see it, or in the comments, right? Okay, there we go. So this is Sutra 2.28, meaning Chapter 2, Number 28, or 79 overall of the whole text. And it reads, Yogang, <coughs> excuse me, Yoganganushtanad ashuddhi kshaye jnana diptir abhiveka kyatehe. Practicing the aids to yoga brings about the dissolution of impurities, resulting in the increase 
of the flame of wisdom, up to and including liberating discerning insight. So right there he's telling us why we're practicing the eight aids to yoga. And he sees that, that first and foremost they accomplish this ashuddhi kshaya, this um, dissolution uh, or wasting away or effacing of impurities. Now what are the impurities here? This is not, these, this word does not denote um, sins or some, some kind of badness in, in you uh, per se. What it denotes is the five kleshas. Uh, of course you could interpret those as sins if you want, but, but uh, you don't need to. <laughs> so the five kleshas, as everyone I imagine knows, are ignorance, attachment, aversion, uh, egoism, oh, I did them in the wrong order, right? Ignorance, <laughs> egoism, attachment, aversion, and fear of death. Those are the five um, kleshas in order of importance. Uh, so the, the five so-called afflictions. Now what do the, the kleshas afflict? Just briefly I'll mention, it's important that in this doctrine they do not afflict the soul. They do not afflict your essence nature. They do not afflict um, the, your real being. They afflict vrittis or mental emotional fluctuations. So vrittis can be afflicted or unafflicted. The great majority of them for most people are afflicted by these five uh, again, ignorance, egoism, attachment, aversion, and fear of death. Okay? So, so it's important that, you know, what he's saying here is that these aids to yoga, they don't directly accomplish spiritual liberation. They just create the conditions in which spiritual lib liberation is much more likely. Okay? Because what they directly accomplish is this uh, effacing or, or dissolution of the of the kleshas. Okay. Now, what he says in the commentary on this particular sutra that I that I pasted in the the comments is that when these uh, afflictions or kleshas diminish, automatically there's a increase of the flame of wisdom. So the idea being, in the metaphor, that it's like the flame of wisdom doesn't have much oxygen. And as you remove these, these sort of veils or something, um, it gets more oxygen, it rises up, and it, it becomes stronger and stronger and stronger. And that's what we want, this, this flame of wisdom to become stronger. Now what kind of wisdom? Well, it's the kind of wisdom that ultimately culminates in what he calls viveka kyati, meaning... Um, discernment, you know, or, or discerning insight, or to be even more precise, liberating discerning insight, because indeed in his system this specific kind of discerning insight is liberating. So what is the discerning insight he wants you to have? He wants you to see that what you are uh, f fundamentally is spirit, <laughs> pure spirit. Uh, purusha in Sanskrit, and purusha actually means person, and he uses that term to mean your true personhood. Okay, so, but how does he define your true personhood? As unborn, undying, unchanging, untainted, and untaintable um, consciousness. Okay, pure awareness. So, that which... Um, that by which all things are known is this, is this um, conscious power okay, that you fundamentally are. He wants you to see that you are that and not that which you are conscious of. You are consciousness, not what you are conscious of. And what you are conscious of includes not only stuff out there in the world, but your body, your thoughts, your emotions, and so on. Okay, so he wants you to see that your body is part of the world of things that you are not. <laughs> he wants you to see that you are no more your body than anyone else's body. You are no more your body than, you know, trees and cars. And you are not your, your uh, thoughts and you are not your feelings. You are that which knows that there are thoughts and feelings going on. 
Um, so he wants you to see that and, and, and that insight, if it happens non -con <clears throat> excuse me, non-conceptually, then it's a liberating insight. And here's a very, very, very important thing, because I've just explained it to you, so you can easily have the thought, oh, yeah, okay, I'm not, I can see, I can look at my thoughts and feelings, so I'm not my thoughts and feelings. You can have that thought, but that's not liberating. The thought is not liberating, you see, because that thought is still happening within the mind, which is part of what you are not. So he wants you to have um, the, the, this insight on a non-conceptual level. Now, how can this happen? Because and it sounds really hard. Um, and by the way, we'll take questions in a moment. Um, so here's, here's the important thing, and I'm going to get to how this has been so, so badly misunderstood. Um, but first, let's just understand that the way in which the insight happens is like this. You need to have a direct experience of your true nature. And the only way that can happen, he argues, is if that which you think you are dissolves and you discover that you're still there. Now, what you mainly think you are is the mind, the discursive thinking mind, right? You think you're the thinker of your thoughts. So, Patanjali says, if you can have an experience of profound inner stillness and silence, even just for a minute, or half a minute, you know, or 10 seconds. There's no specific time limit because it's a timeless moment. You're not really aware of time when you have that experience. But if you have this experience of profound inner stillness and silence, which he calls yoga, then what happens in that space is that the mind, is, as, as you experience it, is absent, is gone, is dissolved. And if you're sort of uh, um, spiritually mature enough, you realize wordlessly, non-conceptually, that you can't be the mind because it's gone and you're still there. So you rest, as he says in Sutra 1.3, you rest in your own essential nature and you just get to experience being what you are. Okay, You can't see the innermost self because it's the point from which all seeing is done. So the phrase vision of the self is used purely metaphorically. You cannot have a vision of the self because you cannot see the point from which all seeing is done. But you can be it, right? So this is the experience he wants you to have, the experience of yoga, where you experience your own conscious presence free of the mind, free of the churnings and movements and uh, anxieties and thoughts and fears and desires of the mind. And so in that moment you realize what you are and what you're not. And then that realization needs to be sort of nourished until it um, becomes your default state. Okay? Now, how, how do we um, understand how the aids to yoga play into all this? Well, like I said, each, each one provides a foundation for the following. Uh, as he explains, and, and I'll try to be brief with this because it could get, could get long otherwise, um, if you're doing the yamas and niyamas, then when you sit, you can sit still. That's kind of huge. It's simple but huge. That, that it is um, engaging in acts of verbal or mental or physical violence agitates the body-mind. It's harder to sit still. It's harder to calm down, settle down. Acts of untruth agitate the body-mind. Acts of theft agitate the body-mind. Um, un uh, unrestrained um, sexuality agitates the body-mind. And on and on. All the yamas and niyamas he understands as counters or antidotes to those acts, mental, physical, um, and, and verbal acts that agitate the body-mind. So if you're following the yamas and niyamas, not perfectly, because nobody could, but if you're following them, you know, decently well, you find you're able to sit more still and settle down. And that's very, very... Okay, we're back. Connection goes in and out. 
Um, okay, so the ability to sit still. Patanjali certainly envisions a meditative practice where you adopt an asana and you stay in that asana um, with practice for, for 24 minutes. You don't change your, your pose. Why 24 minutes? That's one ghatika. That's a unit of time called the ghatika. Then maybe you change your posture and sit for longer, or maybe that's as long as you sit. Anyway, then when you can sit in a still and settled posture, it becomes easier to practice effective pranayama, okay? Again, you don't have to master posture before you practice pranayama. It's just you get some, some success together in sitting still and steady um, and comfortably. Uh, that, uh, as he famously says, you need to sit still and steady but not be in agony, <laughs> okay? But be able to sit comfortably. And then you can do more effective pranayama, and he discusses different types of pranayama in the text. You can learn about those if you want to join our, our Yoga Sutra course. But the most basic kind of pranayama is simply lengthening the breath. Ayama, lengthening the prana. Pranayama, literally prana lengthening, breath lengthening. Lengthening the breath, making it longer, slower, and deeper. And putting a little pause at the end of the inhale, end of the exhale. Okay? That's the simplest form, and it's the most effective in, uh, form. It's really for many people, it's, it's all you need, okay? So, yes, we're recording this, by the way. Okay, so then, pratyahara, the ability to turn the energy of the senses inward. Now, the superficial understanding of pratyahara is that you, you need to do something like this. you know, Shanmukhi Mudra, it's called, um, and just just absolutely shut everything out. Well, it's not that that's wrong. <laughs> it's that if you've got your yamas, niyamas, asana, and pranayama going on, then it becomes much more easeful to simply direct attention within. So the mind becomes less uh, attracted to and pulled by external sensory phenomena. You know, so before you've got this going on, you know, you hear a sound that you're sitting and you hear a sound. You're like, oh, what's that sound? Even if you don't think that thought, the mind does that. Have you noticed? You're sitting and the mind kind of goes over there to where the sound is, <laughs> uh, whether or not you think a thought about it. And so in this pratyahara phase, we're inviting this ability to just get absorbed internally. And, and it's a, you know, there's a certain amount of kind of just maturity of some kind that's needed. Some people just aren't aren't there yet. You know, I teach a meditation and there's always, if it's a big enough group, there's always one person in the room who when I gently open my eyes to, to check is just kind of like, as if they didn't hear the instructions at all. But the, it's not that the, there's anything wrong with them. It's just that it's not clicking yet. This ability to just become absorbed internally. And it's important that that internal absorption is not a kind of trance state, right? But, but, but an awake state, awake, aware presence, conscious presence directed internally to itself, you know, but, but to, to kind of, it, it, there's sort of an onion peeling thing that happens, right? Kind of peeling through some layers before that resting in the, in the inner self occurs, okay? So, pratyahara is, is it, at this point in the eight aids, we, we, it, it starts becoming a cross-fade thing, where that is to say it's not, um, it, there's no clear demarcations, right, between uh, pratyahara, dharana, dhyana, and samadhi. Each cross-fades into the next. You can't just be like, okay, now I'm done with that, now I'm going to do the next thing that with practice, they just m sort of one melts into the next, okay? So having kind of directed all the energy of the senses in the mind internally, then you, you are ready to do dharana, which is uh, fixing the attention to a single point. So for um, a beginning practitioner, that might be an external point. You might open your eyes and gaze at a candle flame or, 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 or a dot or something. Um, 
or for a slightly more advanced practitioner, it could be an internal point, whether it's physical, like the bridge of the nose or the navel or the base of the heart, or it could be subtler than that. But for that, you have to be a very advanced practitioner because you cannot rest attention on something that doesn't remain there for very long. So, uh, you know, how subtle the, the object of attention is depends on, on, on how, whether it can sort of remain there um, for, the, for the duration of the meditation, okay? So, so dharana really means sort of concentration, right? And dhyana is just successful concentration. Dhyana is often translated as meditation, but this is just a loose and, and, and technically inaccurate translation because dhyana just means successful concentration, right? So in the dharana phase, as Patanjali explains, you, your concentration is not perfect yet, and that's okay. You're, you're, you're staying with whatever you're focused on, but your, con your, 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 your attention wavers sometimes, right? But it, you keep coming back. We all know that phase well, I imagine. You, you get pulled off, you keep coming back. And that's dharana, right? Um, so with dhyana, though, it potentially says it's as if, in, in, in the metaphor he uses in the commentary, it's as if you had drops of oil falling on a target. And the, they're, they're drops because they're intermittent, <laughs> intermittently hit, hitting the target. And then what happens is the oil becomes a continuous flow, metaphorically speaking. Why is he using this metaphor of oil? A flow of oil because if you have a very steady hand and you take melted ghee or some oil and you pour it very steadily the flow of the oil looks almost still it's moving but the actual column of oil is like in, looks incredibly still you know that's dhyana he specifically says that it's a state where attention is flowing towards the object continuously and it's dynamic stillness. I love that definition and it's really a literal translation of what he's talking about, dynamic stillness. That's dhyana, okay, but it's still not, it's still not meditation per se. Um, so what that means is that whatever, whatever emotions or thoughts arise, if any do, they are part of that flow. They're in relationship with the object of focus, right? They just, everything flows toward the object of focus. The mind and whatever vrittis it has, everything flows towards the object of focus. Now, what happens in samadhi? The mind merges with, dissolves into the object of meditation, becomes one with it to the extent that it actually dissolves into it, okay? Now, this is hugely important because throughout the modern yoga world, we hear a phrase that is absolutely wrong as, as far as Patanjali is concerned. We hear that samadhi is when you merge with the object of meditation. That is utterly missing Patanjali's point. I, I understand it's an easy mistake to make, but it's, but it's completely the opposite of his intended meaning. Why? Because in Patanjali's system, you are not the mind, and it's the mind that merges with the object of meditation. So the very mistake which is commonly made, and I mean all over the world of, of modern yoga, you merge with the object of meditation, that's samadhi. That fundamental error prevents uh, the person from actually experiencing samadhi. Well, not necessarily. They could just experience it spontaneously, but if you, are if you are identified with the mind, um, then, then you're missing the point, right? So, let me explain it um, phenomenologically, meaning experientially, and, and, and then we'll go to questions. Um, if you dissolved into the object of meditation, you would be absent. You would be non-existent. There would just be the object and no you. Okay, but the mind dissolves into the object of meditation. What is that like experientially? Very simple. Um, and the object could be anything. Let's say it's a it's a flower. You know, when when I achieve samadhi, 
not that I achieve it, right? Because you can't make it happen. You're just patient enough and eventually it happens. You can't give yourself credit for it, right? Because you don't do it. But anyway, there's the flower. When samadhi finally happens, my mind gets so absorbed in the flower that all that remains is the flower enveloped within consciousness. The flower is sort of shining within consciousness in this absolutely pure flowerness. You know, it's just, it's it, the fullness of it, of its flowered nature is apparent and I'm no longer overlaying concepts or, or, or thoughts or memories onto it, even subconsciously. Nothing comes between me and the flower. Because the flower, my mind is dissolved into the flower, or whatever it is. And the flower alone shines forth in consciousness. That is Patanjali's exact phrase. So mind gone, and you realize that you are this pure conscious presence within which objects shine with their full radiant beauty and, and express their true nature, which is ineffable. No object, not a flower, not a pencil, not, nothing, can be understood conceptually when we... When it, every object is ineffable, in a sense, is, is something that can't be fully captured in words, right? Um, so... Otherwise, like for example, if, if, if you could fully capture the taste of a mango in words, then by describing it to somebody, you would make them taste mango. But you can't do that, right? So, let me just finish this, right? Um, the object alone shines forth within consciousness. Now, that's called sabija samadhi, samadhi with a single object. That is aid number eight, so-called limb, or aid number eight, okay? Now, remember that yoga is that which all the eight aids lead to. So yoga is the state in which then the object of meditation falls away. And again, you can't make that happen. It just happens naturally, or, or it doesn't. So there I am with my flower. It's shining in awareness, and then it dissolves too, and there's nothing except consciousness, nothing except my own conscious presence. No thoughts, no feelings, no objects, just this pure, unbroken stillness filled with conscious presence, okay? And in that's where I can actually start to realize my true nature. The object has to fall away. That's near Bija Samadhi, which, again, Patanjali says, is yoga. That's the state called yoga. That's what all the eight uh, aids have been leading up to. And, and it might sound impossible. You might be like, oh my god, that just sounds way too hard. Forget it. But again, experiencing it for just a few seconds could be all you need. And that's not so impossible. Okay? So, finally, then, <laughs> Patanjali says, as a result of this yoga experience, you have insight into your true nature, which he calls sam, samyag jnana, meaning true insight, accurate insight, or accurate knowing, experiential knowing. But he also calls it viveka khyati, uh, discerning knowing, <laughs> discerning insight. And if that insight goes deep enough to sort of blow away <laughs> enough um, subtle impressions or some skadas of, of believing that you are the body and the mind and so on, right? When the insight goes deep enough to kind of, um, like a roto-rooter, <sighs> some of those some scars of body-mind identification get blown away, either little by little, over many, many, many yoga experiences, or in one big push, that's very, very rare, by the way, don't, don't expect to be that person, um, then Kaivalya. Kaivalya means absolute liberation, the state in which your, your, your knowing of your true nature is not going to go away, cannot go away. You've known, it, you've known yourself so completely you can't unknow it. Okay? That's Kaivalya, that's what all of this leads up to, that's the goal of the system, liberation. Um, total freedom. Because if you finally, truly know 
experientially know, not conceptually, what you are so deeply that you can never be pulled back into body identification, mind identification, emotion identification, memory identification, any of that. You're free. You're free. And you're free on every possible level. You're free on social levels because like what people's opinion of your body mind is doesn't matter because you're not your body mind, right? Um, you're free on, on every kind of level. You're free of fear of death, one of our biggest fears, if not the biggest, right? Um, because only the body mind dies and you know directly and experientially that you're not that. You can't die. What you are cannot die because it was never born. Okay, so that's the point. Um, and this is all very clear in the Sanskrit. You know, the, the funny thing about this philosophy and most Indian philosophies is they just are, make much more sense in Sanskrit. It's very hard to put them into English in a way that's super clear. And so what people think in the West, they tend to think if they haven't investigated, the Indian philosophy is vague and airy-fairy and woolly thinking and pretty sounding spiritual ambiguities. Absolutely untrue. The philosophies are extremely well thought out, well worked out, precise, unambiguous, brilliantly clear, but in Sanskrit, it's very hard to put that into English without very, very, very well developed um, linguistic and pedagogical skills, okay? But in Sanskrit, everything makes um, perfect sense here and is super clear. Um, it's just the translation that becomes the challenge. So let's go to questions. Yeah, so um, I notice Inder, Inder Ka says, uh, talks about, mentions uh, Abhinava Gupta. And it, what's significant here is that what Tantra adopted and uh, from Patanjali was not so much his philosophy, his metaphysics, but his practices. So, so some people think well, Tantra superseded Patanjali, so we don't need to study Patanjali. Um, no, because Patanjali was hugely influential on Tantra, and his practices all got absorbed into Tantra, even if um, they might dispute his, his metaphysics. Um, okay, so Kelly, okay, that's a comment, not a question. Thank you for your comment. Well, it looks like we don't have any questions. Well, I mean, we could we could end there, but um, if you have questions, go ahead and type them in. Before I take the questions, let me just say for those who are still on, um, we are doing this very very brief flash sale of the Yoga Sutra course. Um, a lot of work went into this course, so we can't give it away. <laughs> a lot of work on many levels. Um, so the, the, the important thing about this course that makes it different from any other Yoga Sutra course is there's 10 minute videos, bite-sized chunks that everyone can deal with, <laughs> right? I, I used to make three hour long videos, right? But in modern life, the 10 minute video format works great. So it's average, some are a little longer, but average of 10 minutes on each sutra. So you can go sutra by sutra and under, understand each one with total perspica perspicacity, <laughs> lucidity, clarity, and accessibility. And so we did um, about 120 sutras all told, not the entire text, but all that's relevant to, to, to yoga practitioners um, and, and what gets studied today. So you can uh, take a year to go through these 120 sutras at, at 10 minutes apiece because you need to rewatch many of them because even though the translation is clear sometimes it's talking about something that's very very subtle and it just needs contemplation and, and revisiting um, so I'm, I'm very proud of it a lot of work into this went into this translation um, because my goal was to make clear what other translators had left unclear and I, I think we succeeded. 
um, most of the time, maybe 95%. There's one or two sutras I'm still not totally sure about. Um, okay. So I, I invite you to, to explore it. Um, and there are also practices, you know, because the thing, the sutras that were least clear up till now in other translations were the practice sutras, the sutras on what you're actually doing. Um, and so I hope I've been able to shed some light on those. I'm not sure I fully understand one or two of the sutras on pranayama, but I understand what he's talking about in, with regard to meditation, with regard to pratihara, dhadana, dhyana, samadhi, because I've experienced that. And I've talked to others about it too. A scholar can't work in a vacuum and um, gotten good feedback. Okay. So here's the questions. What happens after one experiences and attains samadhi? Well, I covered that earlier. Um, you, you, you need to experience samadhi enough to gain insight accurate insight into your true nature and you need to that insight to go deep enough for you to experience kaivalya permanent liberation that's the idea so some patience it, it may be called for right because it's not, there's no such thing as a, a sudden enlightenment or if there is it's incredibly rare and you you shouldn't worry about it um joey asks what is dharma mega in chapter four it's quite mysterious. I'm not going to get into it a, a whole bunch now, but some scholars think chapter four was added later and not by the, the author of chapters one through three. I think th that could be very well be true. It certainly seems to have come from a different pen. If you read Sanskrit, it feels different. You know, it's very, very, very concerned with refuting the Buddhists. Whereas in the previous chapters, we see an indebtedness to Buddhism, almost an admiration of Buddhism, right? And then in chapter four, all these criticisms of Buddhist philosophy, it's, it's, it's strange. So what is Dharma Mega? The cloud of qualities, where Dharma, a lot of people don't know that Dharma can mean qualities, um, positive qualities, um, virtues, but also more fundamental kinds of qualities. So I think Dharma Mega Samadhi, I'd have to research more because I didn't focus on chapter four, but I think it refers to um, this, this sort of ultimate attainment where you're, where you're not only free, but have um, blossomed forth and expressed all the, all the potential qualities of spiritual liberation. Because someone could be um, liberated, but not necessarily expressing it in such a way as to, as to benefit all beings, you know? So that in this Dharma mega state, the cloud of positive qualities has has sort of enveloped <laughs> this liberated being. It's some something beyond, something higher. Um, okay. So we can wrap up soon here. Alex asks uh, about um, Yamas and niyamas and transgressive tantric practices. That's a big topic. <laughs> but, um, you know, the transgressive pra uh, tantric practices in general don't violate uh, the yamas and niyamas, um, except when they do. <laughs> and they're only for advanced practitioners who've already demonstrated that they uh, can abide by the yamas and niyamas. So if you haven't conquered your addictions, you have no business doing the transgressive ritual where you're drinking wine and so on. You have no business doing that if you haven't conquered your addictions. Does that make sense? So that in Tantra, that's absolutely true. Um, and that's all I'll say about it for now. So Inder asks, um, the pause in the breath cycle now, this is not given much attention in Patanjali at all, but in Tantra, or in Shaivism, it's given quite a bit of attention, especially this experience that some of you might have had, where the breath spontaneously becomes still. And it's, it's just the breathing just stops. And pe if people don't know about this experience and its importance, they actually freak out a little bit. And, oh, I, I've got to breathe. <laughs> but the body 
has its own intelligence. If the breath stops in deep meditation, just trust it. It will start again. You're not going to drop dead, okay? Promise you. Nobody's ever done that. So don't try to hold it, you know, indefinitely, and don't try to think, oh, i got to start breathing. Just let it stop come to rest in Tantra uh, or in Tantric Shaivism, that's considered very, 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 very important, um, significant experience. Can't say more about that now. Um, Kelly asks about Prakasha Vimarsha. No, these terms are not used in Patanjali and classical yoga at all. They come from Bhartarhari and his Vakyapadiya. So you can look up uh, Parthar Hari. I'll type it in the in the window here. I discussed this, by the way, in my new book that's coming out. This exact question of the origins of Prakasha Vimarsha. Okay. Shiva says, I have heard Samadhi described as when you sit down and meditate and the 24 minutes passes without you feeling any time has passed. That could be Samadhi. I don't know, but for Patanjali, it's not Samadhi unless there's total stillness. There's, there has to be total stillness of the mental emotional fluctuations, the chitta vrittis. If there's not total stillness, it's not Samadhi. That's why for most people, it's a very brief experience. It can be longer. Um, by the way, in the course, I tend, in the Yoga Sutra course, I am not interpreting each sutra from a tantric point of view. I'm interpreting it just directly, straight, from a Patanjalian point of view, except when the interpretations differ in a significant way. And then I'll say, okay, now in, in Tantra, it's interpreted this way. But often, especially for practice, uh, the interpretations are not significantly divergent. So, Jerry asks, uh, if you were to take away one nugget from the Yoga Sutra, what would you say that is? Is it a himsa? I would say no, definitely, from my perspective, definitely not a himsa, because what the text is obsessed with, the main thing about the text is, discover the truth of what you are. That's what he's interested in. That's what he's passionate about, you know. Probably he was a very calm guy, but I like to imagine him getting passionate about this, <laughs> you know. Discover the truth of what you are. That is what motivated him to write the text. Can I recommend a translation of the Yoga Sutra? Um, my own. <laughs> because there's lots of great translators out there. But surprisingly few of them are long-term meditators, you know. One is Chip Hartranft, um, and he's a long-term meditator. He really understands meditation. His translation is great, but sometimes it's inaccurate due to his Sanskrit not being strong enough. Um, but it's still worth reading because his, his perspective on meditation is, is valuable, and, but it, and his translation is often correct, you know. So somebody who has super good Sanskrit and, and a long-term meditation practice, um, which is actual meditation and not just trancing out, uh, that's really rare. And, you know, there are a few uh, such translations that are very old now, and, um, you know, their English is just not very accessible. So, um, you know, I, I hate to sound so, so self-promoting, but... Um, you know, so far students have agreed that the translation they're getting in the course is much clearer um, than anything they've, they've read before. So that'll be published as a book in another year, year and a half. Um, just ask the students, because I don't want to say it, but they, they are saying, oh, this translation, I finally understand what the heck's going on here. Um, so Jerry raises an important point. We're about to finish here, but um, Jerry raises an important point uh, that even in Samadhi, uh, enlightenment, by the way, potentially doesn't use that word enlightenment at all. He says uh, kaivalya, liberation. But uh, one may feel they are liberated, yet also cause harm to mind bodies, their own or other people's. Well, not in Patanjali's system. 
because in Patanjali's system, when you attain Kaivalya, you essentially become inactive, you know. You're content just to be a witness, you know. This is not the Tantric view, but it is Patanjali's view. Um, so you're not, you don't cause harm to anyone because you don't do anything, you know. <laughs> so at least who knows what actually happened to people who, who attained um, what he's talking about within his system and within communities exclusively practicing his system. We don't have those communities anymore. They don't exist and haven't for many, many, many hundreds of years. Um, so we don't know what that looked like, right? But certainly it seems to be the case that with this, that, that he counters that objection by essentially implying that you become inactive uh, in Kaivalya. We could do a little practice to end if you guys want. There's a lot more comments it looks like now that have come in that I don't have time to get to. We've got to keep this under an hour, I think. Stephanie asks about Sutra 27. Does he explain the seven stages? Yes, in the commentary. So you'll get that um, in my translation. You'll get that right away if you join the course, because <laughs> we've already passed that point in the course. The five kleshas are discussed in some depth in the text. You can definitely learn more about them in the text, in the course, uh, Joseph. Christine asks, I'm just super quick going through these. Christine asks, uh, would you say that Patanjali inherited a system of non-Vedic practices? Yes, to some extent, because he borrows from Buddhism, such as he borrows the four Brahma Viharas. Uh, what is that sutra? Is it? I can't remember the number. Um, in chapter one, he borrows stuff from Buddhism, essentially. None of it is tantric, because Patanjali is pre-tantric. Yeah, there, there was... Well, there probably was proto tantra around at his time, but but you know it was it was barely present. Uh, it was just beginning. Um, okay, uh, it looks like we're looks like we're about done. Thanks for all the comments. And those of you who missed the beginning, uh, will, the recording will post almost immediately. Please um, check it out. So for those who want to join the course, we are only, it's only on sale for 24 more hours. Um, then it will be gone, possibly for a few months. So please just jump on it, go for it, sign up. I promise you won't regret it. Um, it's it probably more work went into this course than anyone I've, I've ever done. Um, and there, it's a real labor of love um, and by myself and by Lisa, who's, who's on this um, stream here. Uh, Lisa Larn, who, who, who taught herself video editing software and many other things to bring off this course. So thank you for all those who've joined um, and will we'll continue. And we're still posting, uh, it's the, the, the course is ongoing, but once you sign up, you get lifetime access, so you don't have to complete it in a certain amount of time. You don't have to be anxious about that. Um, you, you have all the time you need to do it. And I'll answer their questions, further questions within the course. So finally, we can just um, take a breath. <laughs> we can just drop into a a mini practice, a two minute practice, I call it a micro meditation. So the easiest thing to say is just relax the face, jaw, head and neck and let awareness drop down into the center of your being. And just tune into that sacred center that's always there. It's never not there. It's just about dropping into it. This beautiful sacred center that is what you fundamentally are. Your own conscious presence. 
unborn and undying. It's already perfect and always has been. It's not wounded, it's whole. It's just the quiet presence, the quiet feeling of being you at the center of it all. Om. Please remember, I'll leave you with this. Please remember that no matter how crazy things get in your own mind or your life, that there's always an eye of the storm. It cannot fail to be there. It might be hard to drop into it, but it's there. No matter how violently the storm is whirling, still center, the eye of the storm, the still point at the center of the turning world. That's what this is all about. Om. Shubhamastu. Sarve sham swastir bhavatu. Sarve sham muktir bhavatu. Sarve sham purnam bhavatu. Sarvesham mangalam bhavatu, loka samasta sukhino bhavantu.